Hey guys, this is Eric. I'm back for another video on answering people's questions. Uh, I've yet to finalize a name for the series. I'm thinking about starting a hashtag, like hashtag ask I am Rosen, and then have people answer questions via Twitter. But if anyone has other suggestions, just let me know in the comments. Uh, for this video, I want to address a question that was left in the YouTube comments from someone named Chet Heflin. And I'll bring up the question here. Uh, it's a little bit long. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But essentially, he mentioned, okay, he mentioned my DVD on the London, which is distributed through iChess. And there's a separate video on, on iChess's channel where I give a, a quick introduction to the course. Um, I can leave a link in the description if people want to check that out. Uh, but essentially, he's asking about how to meet c5 on move one if, if white's playing d4 and if you're a London player and what I would recommend. Um, and he went on kind of a ramble here, uh, not to say that rambling is bad or anything, but he maybe had this inner conflict of whether to respond with c3 or respond with d5. And um, I'm more than happy to, to give some suggestions and uh, and show what I would play, maybe share some secrets. So uh, let's go ahead and switch over to the board. Let's get to this position with d4, c5. I would say there's two main options for white, which I'll actually go through both of them. Um, if you're a London player, this is the one thing it's, it's hard to play the London against. Because uh, the problem is with a move like c3, it's first of all allowing like this immediate trade. It could actually just transpose to like an exchange slav or lines where like black might have an early queen b6, which could be annoying. Um, so I don't recommend playing c3. Uh, let me start with recommending, this is actually my top recommendation, is not to play d5, but to take on c5. I think this is by far the trickiest line that white can play. And it looks somewhat wrong at first it looks weird giving away a center pawn in um because in many cases black can easily win the pawn back but there's a very specific line that um if black walks in two there's uh there's a few different ways like can reach a very pleasant position so let's say black plays e6 here which i believe is the most common move most logical move uh just planning bishop takes e5 now white won't go ahead and hold on to the pawn but white will just develop with knight c3. Let's say black takes the pawn. And now the main idea is to play knight e4, hitting the bishop, but also hitting this uh, this d6 square. And if black is unprepared, this can pose some early problems for black. Um, now, I, I will note this is not a traditional London setup. You just uh, Sometimes it's a matter of reacting to what the opponent is doing. Um, but in this case, there's two main targets. And now white has to, uh, or black has to figure out how to save the bishop and how to cover d6. And it's not so simple for black. If we imagine black plays perhaps a normal move like bishop e7, white is more than happy to hop into d6. I've had many online blitz and bullet games where opponent takes, I take back, and white's already having a very pleasant position. Two bishops, queen on d6 is quite annoying. Uh, white is ready to reinforce this with bishop f4 and casting queenside. So I've uh, I've had pretty good success from this position as white. Um, going back, if bishop e7 isn't played, there's another move which actually looks interesting for black, and it's, uh, it's certainly a playable move, which is d5, allowing white to capture the bishop, but then responding with queen a5 check double attack, winning back the minor piece. Um, now the thing about this line is white has a, a nice idea that after c3, queen takes c5, white can play a really nice kind of positional move, pawn e4. And this isn't a, a sacrifice given that if pawn take e4, then queen g4. And essentially whatever happens from here, the position is going to open up. And because white has the two bishops and white's about to get some initiative, if this queen g4 line happens, uh, white will inevitably have some advantage going forward into the middle game. If black doesn't take on e4 and black plays some other move like uh, knight f6, uh, white 
is also happy to consider a move like e5. I'm checking some opening reference here because I remember playing a game not too long ago where my opponent played knight d7, I played knight f3, and something like this happened, knight c6, bishop f4. This is very much resembling a French structure where if black ends up castling and white can play bishop to d3, there's already ideas of some kind of Greek gift like bishop take h7 and knight g5. So black has to be careful entering these positions where white has this pawn on e5. And just to demonstrate the other line real quick, if uh, if d take e4, queen g4, I mean, white is uh, is happy to win back the pawn. Either the e4 or g7 pawn is falling, and it will lead to a position where both bishops will come in naturally. I've included a game here uh, that I found in the master's database, which I think is a, a good demonstration of how play can continue. I'm not going to go through it in this video, but if people want to take a look, you can find it here. I'll, of course, share the study link in the video description, and you can click uh, the citation here if you want to see that full game between uh, two names I'm not going to even try and pronounce. Um, but, okay, going back to the the line, I think, um, I think in many cases, black will be unprepared for this, and in many cases, white will have a slight advantage. Now, I will go ahead and show the best response for black if, uh, if white were to play this line, and this might be useful for the black players who might play c5 on move one against d4. Uh, the best move for black here is to play knight f6. Using the same idea with queen a5 check, is after knight takes c5, queen a5, c3, queen takes c5. The main difference here is white doesn't have this powerful and explosive e4 move, and it's a bit more positional in nature, and um, white does have the bishop pair, but black has a better pawn center. So th this is about equal. I mean, it's not, it's not bad for white. It's not bad for black. It's playable for both sides. This is the type of position better player will probably win. Um, but it's very playable for white. And I think it's, it's worth perhaps playing this position if, if there's so much potential in the other lines to, uh, to have these, uh, these traps. If white were wanting to continue from this position, I recommend Fee and Kettowing the Light Sword Bishop, and you can enter some line like this. Um, I was doing some computer analysis earlier, and okay, this is a, the go-to setup for white. And if black does go for this e5 move, then white actually has a nice move bishop to g5, just to apply a lot of pressure in the center, perhaps threatening to take and, and double the pawns. And if black goes for a move like knight e4, counterattacking the bishop and removing the, the knight, then white can respond with bishop e3. And okay, there's many ways uh, these lines can branch out, but uh, I think if, if white gets to this position, it's very playable. So that's kind of, uh, it's kind of d takes e5 in a nutshell. Going back from, or going back to this position, I think if you take on c5, it's likely black, black will play e6. And then knowing this knight c3, knight e4 idea should offer some interesting chances for white. Um, now, I did say I, I wanted to cover both options uh, going back to this position. And I do want to talk a little bit about d5 because it's probably the most principled move. And objectively, it's it's the best move. I don't think there's, there's too much argument that can be made. I mean, at a high level, c5 is not popular on move one because of d5, because of the fact that black uh, concedes a lot of space from very early on. Um, now this line, and especially if, if black plays e5 next, which is uh, kind of the move that I think Chet was questioning, this does prevent white from playing the London, because white can no longer develop the bishop to f4, and it doesn't really make sense to take en passant and give away your very nice uh, space-grabbing pawn on d5. So I think it's, if you're looking to go into this line, it's a matter of understanding how to play the structure for white. And I'm gonna keep this relatively simple and just show kind of a basic setup how white should continue development. Uh, I recommend playing e4. I also recommend on holding off of playing c4. And we'll see why this is relevant, but you don't wanna play c4 too early because in many cases you want your light sword bishop to come to b5. In some cases, you're happy to trade off the light squared bishop because your center pawns are on light squares, and this is usually your bad bishop. 
Um, so the bishop would like to come to c5, and normally the knight will develop in front of your c-pawn to c3. And some cases later on, white is happy to bring the knight to f3 and then transfer it to c4. And also combine that with, uh, with a4 to discourage black from playing b5. So I know there's a lot of arrows here, but this is kind of a general summary, even though it's so early in the game. Um, you sometimes want to start thinking about where the pieces are optimized uh, going forward into the middle game. So let's go forward here. I've included a game between Verugia and Jacobian, a pretty well-known lecturer for the St. Louis Chess Club YouTube channel. He had a nice victory over the late Emery Tate back in 2004. And uh, Jacobian used a setup with knight c3 and then bishop to b5 check. And in that game, uh, Tate played knight to d7. And I'll go ahead and show here, let's just switch back to the study view, that if people want to look at this game further, you can go into uh, this link. And this will open up in a new tab. And then you can see the full game. And maybe I'll go ahead and give some brief commentary on this game just to show what happened. So after knight d7, okay, knight f3. Um, now I mentioned earlier that sometimes white is happy trading off light squared bishop. In this case, white keeps the light squared bishop, plays bishop to d3. I think this is also very reasonable because black is so restricted on space, like with all these minor pieces still on the board, there's not too many squares to work with. And white is happy to uh, to keep all the minor pieces on the board. This is a very general rule in chess. When you uh, when you have more space, you should avoid trades of minor pieces. Of course, there's exceptions, and um, okay, I'm not going to get into that too deeply, but um, just something to keep in mind. Uh, black played h6, castling, bishop g5, and then pawn a4. Useful move, preventing b5. I'm actually a bit curious if black plays b5 right away. Uh, what Jacobian had in mind. This might be something to ask the engine. I'm pr pretty sure a4 could be a strong move, given that um, b5 is now a target, and this might provoke black to overextend. Like if black plays b4, then white can play knight d2, and now there's a very nice c4 square. Like white has ideas of knight d2, knight c4, maybe some future f4. Also, if black plays c4 here, Oops, after, uh, after a4, if black plays c4, then the bishop can drop back to e2. And again, black is a bit overextended, like the b5 pawn is still attacked. Okay, if b4, then knight to b1. And I think it's white who's getting the last laugh, given that this pawn is now hanging and severely weak. So maybe that's why a Kobian allowed b5 from, uh, from early on. So bishop g5 was played, a4, okay, preventing b5, grabbing more space. The bishops do get traded. And after knight e7, knight d2, we see this uh, very typical maneuver. And the idea of, of bringing the knight to d2, of course, is to get the c4 square, also to someday play a5 and fix these pawns and also create a weakness on b6. Another idea is to play f4, just expand on the king side, open up, uh, open up the f file and maybe get some king side play as well. So very multi-purpose move, knight d2. Knight g6, knight c4, knight b6, and now knight e3. So white avoids the trade, leaves the knight kind of awkward on b6. Uh, knight f4 is played, a5, kicking the knight, knight d7, g3, kicking the other knight. Uh, white's probably happy here. If the bishop gets traded off, then uh, I think this is a nice structure to play with f4 coming at some point. So things got a bit crazy here after knight h3 check, king g2, and then knight f6, so the knight stayed on h3. And then a Kobian went for knight f5, or as Ben Feingold would say, knife f5. Um, don't sue me for copyright, but this is a nice, uh, a nice little obstruction of the bishop defending the knight. And now this knight is kind of left a bit stranded. Um, and Tate uh, had a reputation of being a very aggressive player. And instead of uh, retreating the knight, like probably a normal person, he played g6 with a counterattack. And then a Kobian took on h3, um, which looks somewhat risky, 
and after g take f5, e take f5, white's up a pawn, but the king's on h3, so it's a very kind of confusing position. Eventually what happened is black won the pawn back, and then the king just ran back to safety. So he went back even further to g1 to avoid bishop h3 check. And from this point forward, white just had a, a pleasant position. Even though it seems like black got some initiative and was able to trade and maybe free up the pieces, white's position is still pleasant for a few reasons. Um, I mean, the c4 pawn is, is quite weak, given that b5 can't be played due to en passant. And it's currently attacked, and rook a4 is on the horizon. And also, black no longer has this g-pawn. Um, so if black wants to castle kingside, I mean, the king's not going to be safe. On, uh, on that part of the board. And in fact, there's not too many safe places on the board for the black king. So let's see what happened. We see f4 is played to open up the center, given that black's king is still in the center, and this is just a very thematic idea. e4 played, and queen e3. Um, so now both of these pawns are targets. Rook c5, knight a4, nice positional move. And then after knight b6, I think this is a big turning point where white wins the queen for uh, for rook and minor piece after rook take a1. They eventually get to this position with white just having a, a substantial advantage. And I'm not going to go any further from here, but uh, the main point of this was to show how, okay, from early on the position is nice to play for white. I think if you know the setup, um, and this is a common practice, like if you don't know perhaps what to do against a certain opening. It's good to see a game of a strong grandmaster and see how they beat another strong player and then try and um, replicate at least how they, they place their pieces. So I hope that helped. If I go back to the study here, I've included the question in the study. If I turn off the Explorer, we can scroll up here and see the full question. I hope I've addressed most of the points. I hope this is of, of uh, some value to, uh, to people. If you guys have any follow-up questions, just let me know, and I'll be happy to answer, and hopefully I'll have the time and energy to do more videos like this. So with that, I will see everyone in the next video. Thanks for watching.